So, uh, as already mentioned, I work for Novo. More specifically, what was not mentioned but should have been. <laughs> <laughs> no. It will be important for this part, but you did not know that yet. So, I work in one of the engineering groups whose job it is to make everyone else's life easier. That means I go through terrible shit so no one else has to. And this presentation is kind of about that as well. It's going to be a war story, a uh, quite bloody one. So let's talk about the project that was involved first. So the business use case is that we have a bunch of trucks and they ship stuff from places to other places and there is a scheduling screen where you can uh, set which trucks will deliver what things where and you drag and drop things around to set things up the way you want. Now, previously uh, this application was, well, built on good old stable struts and serving JSP pages with a whole bunch of XJS code on the client side. And uh, most of the calculations were done on the server side. That was not very responsive, unfortunately. So user experience could have been better. Further than that, is it was a long-lived legacy project. And one of the drawbacks of that is that the code gets a bit messy over time. So this is not an ideal state of affairs, unfortunately. So here was the plan. We're going to rewrite the scheduling screen in Angular. That will be awesome. We can move a lot of calculations to the client, so things will be a lot faster. And in one fell swoop, we also get to clean up the existing code base to make it more clean and well-structured. Everyone will be happy, and the developers will get to play with a hipster new technology. <laughs> Sounds great. Maybe a bit ambitious, but so far, so good. Now. The rewrite actually happens, like, not just like that. It takes a couple of months of hard work and blood, sweat, and tears, but it does happen. It is deployed to the customer. Everything is fine. Or so it seems like. <laughs> Until one, uh, well, I don't think it was rainy, but basically one winter evening in 2017, sometime between Christmas and New Year's, so basically the best time to not be on vacation. Uh, we get a call from a very agitated customer complaining that the performance for them is basically unusable. Specifically, if you drag things around or scroll the list of items, things are literally unusably slow. That's unfortunate for a screen where you literally just drag things around and that's all you do. So we need to do something about this. And first thing is to figure out what is different about this specific customer. Now, it turns out that the data set they have was a lot larger than anticipated. They were trying to schedule with 200 trucks or something along, along those lines, and the application was originally uh, planned to use around 20. That worked just fine. In practice, developers mostly just saw four in action because that <laughs> above that number it gets a little choppy, so you know, why waste time in that? Of course, most everyone on the dev team and the testers as well used Chrome because that's a lot faster. <laughs> it, has, it has good dev tools, like why would you not use it? Unfortunately, the customer uses Firefox, obviously, as you might expect. And uh, yeah, it uh, turns out that the customer is also using ancient laptops and we are using high-end work workstations. So that's, that's basically lesson number one here that you should test in production. Not literally in production, though that would be nice, but you have to have the same exact software environment prepared there. So if you're using, if the customer is using Firefox, then you should be doing that as well. Make sure the database versions and uh, so on match. But beyond the software environment, you also need to consider the hardware environment. That can also affect your life significantly. Like, this doesn't mean you have to ship the exact same piece of metal that the customer will be using, but at least try to approximate it spec-wise. Um, third, and this is, as you might have guessed, critically important that you have a similar data set as what will end up in production. This is not just about amount, so you can have a database with a million records in it, which all have the exact same values, and that will probably perform still decently. Unlike real-life data with one billion records, that will fuck you up. So. Back to the story. We were in quite a bit of a uh, problem here, and this is where I entered the picture, hopefully to make things better and not worse. So my task was to go onto the team for a couple of weeks, 
join Norby, well, that, that Norby back there, actually. And for these two weeks, we would do nothing but focus on performance and try to figure out who murdered performance. So we go undercover and get to work. Now, first step to figuring out what caused this slowdown is, well, to fix the slowdown, the first thing is to know what causes it. So a uh, quick run of the profiler showed that it turns out a lot of the time was spent doing layout and scripting. Neither of these is good. Actually, both of these are pretty bad. This could have been a serious issue if one of them was just in play. So the plan is to go into these two categories, split up, tackle the uh, heaviest items in them, and see where we get. So first half was the JavaScript. The most expensive JavaScript core in our application was app.tick. If you're not familiar with this, this is where Angular does its change detection. Now, I'm going to explain what change detection is in case you're not familiar with the framework. So Angular lets you define a bunch of components which have data fields in them, associate them with a template which can reference these fields, and when you put the two together, you can uh, you end up with whatever, is get, whatever gets rendered to the view in the end. Now, the data binding, data binding part is interesting because this sometimes needs to be updated. And whenever your data changes, Angular will magically run its change detection thing, and then the resulting view is also updated. Now, of course, we know there is no such thing as magic in software, hopefully. And the way it works is that Angular intercepts events any kind of event, whatever they happen, whatever happens, whenever it happens, uh, even if they don't happen to modify the model. But regardless, suppose it does, then the change detection is triggered, which will go through your component hierarchy, check all the bindings, see if the values they reference changed, and if they did, then the resulting view will be updated. Excellent. So um, this is actually a fundamental part of an Angular application. This is not something you can just get rid of. You do need change detection because that's what keeping the model in sync with the view. So what can you do in such a situation? Now, if you're trying to optimize anything, there are fundamentally two paths to that. One is to do whatever you're doing, but do it faster, and the other is to do less of it. With Angular, for in the first column, you have the on-push change detection strategy. This allows you to mark the component or mark a component as a special kind of stateless component, basically, which only needs to be re-rendered if its inputs change. Uh, which is great, but you do need to watch out for one thing. This comparison of the inputs happens via reference. So the reference must change, or the reference can only change if and only if the data is modified. So that, that is a reasonable expectation with immutable objects. Unfortunately, we are not dealing with any of that. And in our case, it happened that some point during the component hierarchy, a bunch of derived data is regenerated if anything changes at all, basically. And you get fresh new references for everything. So that's, that's out of the question. This is just not going to work at all. Now, our other option is to do less frequent change detection, which is possible via the run outside Angular method on the ng zone, but that's, I don't really want to get into the exact details of how that works. And what this does is it allows you to exclude certain events from triggering change detection entirely, which is great as long as the events in question do not end up modifying the model. In our case, the drag and drop and the scrolling were slow, and none of these actually need any data from Angular at all. These just operate on the DOM itself. So we're good to go, and this is where we're going to head. Now, the drag and drop part was implemented in a library called Dragula, and besides the awesome name, it, well, it's actually a pretty good library. Let me quickly show you what it looks like. Pay no attention to this. Oh, it's already loading, wow. Or how do I share that? I don't know. Well, that's going to be awkward. That is going to be real awkward. So, um, basically, all you need to do here is declare a bunch of elements as containers, and then you can drag and drop items between them. Wow, amazing. This is like, you can't believe this is already 2005. So, 
And what it also does is, is it renders a mirror element which will follow your cursor and a shadow element which will, which uh, is where the element will end up if you drop it. So this is just so uh, you know the terminology I will be using in the following couple of slides. Let me get this out of the way. Okay. And back here. Right, so drag view is pretty cool. Cool. One drawback of that is uh, it was not built for performance at all. So that's, that's the only thing, and that is what is screwing up us here. But before I talk about performance, let me quickly explain. Jesus Christ. Let me quickly explain what uh, a browser's rendering pipeline looks like. So you fire off some JavaScript code that modifies the layout or whatever. And that will trigger rendering. The first part of it is called layout. So as far as the browser is concerned, everything you draw onto the screen is just a bunch of boxes. And this is the part of the code which figures out where those boxes go, how large they should be, what positions they should be at, and so on. Now, after that, you need to fill those boxes with content, with text, with colors, with borders, and so on. This step is known as paint. And lastly, these boxes can be painted onto various separate layers. Similar to Photoshop, these can be transformed and moved independently. But to get a final image, you will need to put all of them together, and this is known as compositing. Now, this is just the sequential order of the things, but what is also important is how much time they take relative to each other. And this is how you should think about that. Um, scripting is medium heavy, let's just put it that way. Layout is typically super expensive and compositing typically takes no time at all. So this is what you can leverage in your optimization. Now, okay, so layout might seem a bit big scary word here, but turns out in practice this is usually not that bad by itself because all the rendering can happen asynchronously. So when the browser does that, it's not blocking anything else you're doing, except uh, you can break this as well. And the way you do that is you modify the layout and then read it back via JavaScript. This breaks the assumption that you do not need the layout to happen immediately. And in fact, the browser will patiently wait for the layout to finish before your script is allowed to resume. This results in scripting times which are insanely long. And that's pretty much the worst thing you can do to performance. So don't do that. Now let's talk about how Dragula and does this and why. Now, one problem it needs to solve is to figure out where the shadow element goes, what container you're over. And to do that, there is a browser API known, uh, named element for, get element from point. And what this does is it tells you the topmost element under the cursor, which is going to be the mirror element because that's what you're dragging around. So that is absolutely no use to us. So Dragula does work somehow and what it does, in this case, is temporarily hide the mirror element, do the get element from point check. This will trigger forced reflow, so you're fucked. And then it will show the element again, so it looks like nothing ever happened, except your performance is just destroyed. Now, in newer browsers, you can use the get elements from point API, which will tell you all the elements under the cursor, in which case you do not need to do this show hide madness at all. And that's a whole lot faster. So that was one issue that we encountered. Second, um, you are dragging an element around that needs to be positioned where the cursor is. The way you track the position of the cursor in a uh, browser is the mouse move event. Uh, that, that, so far that is entirely reasonable. Now the thing that surprised me is that it is not specified at all how often this mouse move event should fire. Reasonable would be once per frame, but in fact that is not usually how it works. It can fire an arbitrary number of times. So if whatever logic you are doing happens to take quite a lot of time, you might be doing a lot of unnecessary work. In this case, the way it, uh, way it happened was that you would calculate the position of the mirror element 10 times and then discard the first nine. So you are cutting your performance in uh, one tenth of what it should be for no reason. Thankfully, uh, we have the request animation frame API for that, which will schedule a callback to be run just before the browser repaints. And that is what you need here. 
So basically, we do zero work in the individual mouse move handlers, and then just once at the end, right before we redraw, we do the all, all the calculations that are necessary. So the next and final issue with regular was that it used it used absolute positioning to order uh, to determine the position of well absolute positioning to position elements. Well, you would not expect that, but basically that is how it. Uh, position the mirror element. So when you move that around, it needs to do a repaint if it happens to be in the same layer. We mentioned layers before, they can be moved independently of one another with basically zero cost. And to actually trigger a layer being created, you can use the transform Z hack. And then we will not, not need the repainting at all. And it's just moving the layer around. So that is good, but all of this put together, the slowdown is mitigated considerably, but not fixed. We still have another part of the equation, which was the scroll bar. Now, for scroll bar, we use the Mollyhoo custom scroll bar library, which just makes your scroll bar prettier. And that's all it does, basically. And that, this is what is destroying the performance for various reasons that I don't even really want to get into because you can just look at a code and look at this. This this is the code that this this what what <laughs> who would write this and why I have no idea this is just one return statement by the way and if by some miracle you manage to figure out what this does good luck this oh by the way this is the source code this is not minified at all this is <laughs> someone sat down and typed all this into its so this is online two thousand four hundred I mean there so 200 more lines like this <laughs> you can maybe guess why all of this is well not as fast as it should be among other problems <coughs> and that's lesson number two if you have a dependency you probably have a liability as well a liability as well so there is a joel spolsky blog post named in defense of not invented here syndrome which uh, mentions that when you're in a good team with great programmers, everyone else's code is frankly bug-infested garbage. I think you just saw an example for that. And code quality is not the only thing you should be worrying about when you pull in a dependency. One thing is that you have a very specific problem in your application, and chances are someone, or someone tried to solve that problem in a slightly different way. And whatever library you end up pulling in will have a different feature set than what you need. Some extra things, some things missing, and you do have to work around that. That will also take some time, and maybe it will be just simply to write the whole thing on your own. Third, um, presumably the code you do write for yourself is something you actually document and can understand as well. With uh, just random code pulled off of GitHub, you might not be that lucky, and source code or the documentation can both work against you. Now, all of this is not to say that you should never ever use third-party libraries because, well, I, I'm, I'm using PowerPoint here and the, Angular, uh, the application was written with Angular, so some, well, some consistency is there, but basically you do need to consider your own code as a viable alternative if you take all these factors into consideration. So, yeah, the scroll bar is shit, we can't do anything about it. Um, but, if with the fixes we have applied so far, we managed to get actually really good performance out of just a dozen or two dozen trucks. If, if those are on the screen and nothing else, then we have a shot at making this work. Now, the problem is we're dealing with 200, so we have to get that number down a bit. And the way we're going to do that is virtual scrolling. This is... Uh, tried and true technique where you only render the elements on the screen that are actually visible to the user. Now, based on the previous lesson, you might have guessed that this is something we're going to write ourselves. And that's not the only reason, because we do have a few additional constraints here, that, namely that change detection must not be triggered under any circumstances unless absolutely necessary, because for the previously mentioned reasons that will have a significant performance impact. And whatever library we write or use should support variable height rows. Back in 2017, none of the third party libraries I've checked did both of these correctly. So 
let's, well, I wonder how that would work. So let's quickly check out what this looked like in practice. OK, so you see none of this, basically, so far. Give me a second. No, that's to the right. Great. Yep. Now I see none of that. That's the other unfortunate consequence. Mm -hmm. God damn it. You mean make it smaller. OK, good. <laughs> no, actually. All right, actually, the code is entirely inconsequential here. Now, the interesting part is that you see the code on the left and then see the application on the right. This is not the scheduling screen, by the way. You might have noticed. This is just a quick test framework to check whether virtual scrolling is working properly at all. And yeah, it is. This whole red box is the whole list of items that we need to render, and the red and blue bars represent the entire viewport that is visible. Whoops, well, that's a bug there. <laughs> this is what you get for having a live demo. Anyway, an intentional bug is that the last element seems to be missing. And what's good, in, if you have a, such a setup that can automatically refresh immediately, then you can fix these issues much quicker as well. So that was an off by an error. Refreshes, and now it's fine. OK. Now, this way you can catch functional bugs quickly and easily. You make something that is incorrect, and it will look incorrect as well. Now, remember that I mentioned that we had the requirement that change detection should not be triggered at all, unless necessary. And that's something that's easier to overlook. Like, it's not obvious right now whether I am triggering change detection or not. So what you do is to make that visible. There is a small little NPM module called ngxcdmon, which will write a bunch of messages to the console anytime change detection is triggered. And that's also on the wrong screen, so you don't see that. Just a matter of hours. OK, <gasps> okay good, good. Right. So you can see I can scroll around and that, that right, oops, that's a bit too much. That's change detection happening for no reason whatsoever. OK. So that's also just a bug in the code, which I have introduced deliberately, so. Fix that and just to show that I'm not lying. This is no longer triggering change detection. Amazing. If you haven't worked in Angular, you don't know how amazing this is and how much work this took, but it is amazing, trust me. Yeah, and sometimes it does when it does need to re-render items. Now, that's, you can go away, and you can go away as well. So that's another key part. Whatever is not visible, you have to make visible. This is just a summary of what you saw. Now, five days and 100 lines of code later, the virtual scrolling is implemented. It doesn't have too many bugs. At least no one notices when it ships to production. And in the end, what we end up with is roughly 300 times faster than what we started with, which is a pretty good number. But imagine how slow it was before, but you know. We ship it to the customer. Everyone is happy. We can go back home and lay down, celebrate. If, if only it were that easy. <laughs> So not long after, we get a call from the same customer. Things are still horribly slow. And without additional input, no one really has a clue how that could be happening. I mean, we optimize this thing shitless. Like, it should run well on a toaster. And it doesn't. What it takes is a plane trip for one of our colleagues to go over to the customer, check out what they're doing. And this is what they see. So first, they go to the scheduling screen, close everything, minimize everything but the trucks view so you can fit more of them on the screen, and then turn down the browser zoom level to 50%. And suddenly, you have 200 trucks on the screen with five pixel high uh, tall text, so it's pretty much unreadable, but that's what I do. 
for I, I don't know why I still don't know why but that's that's how they use this application apparently and well we have well we did not expect this or predict this but it does explain our performance problems however this this would have been critical information like 15 slides earlier or two weeks before like right there you know and that's that's lesson three you should have a specification and it should contain things like this not just functional stuff but even that will save you time because if you have a specification that is considerably easier to analyze and change than code you have already written like it did not would not change or will not take that much time to write a virtual scrolling which then does absolutely nothing useful in this case so we could have avoided that now another important part is to consider non-functional requirements here as well because uh, those are a bit trickier for example performance now um, yeah I know I'm, I'm cheating but never mind so <laughs> the well the reason non-functional requirements are a bit special is that they are more often than not overlooked unfortunately whether you care about them or not they are still there so they will bite you in the ass if you choose to ignore them another reason they are special is that they tend to be systemic qualities so it's not just like a feature that you write once and cross off your list go back home and then you're done but this is something that you need to monitor continuously to ensure that you're still actually meeting your requirements so basically where we're at now we are in deep shit and we have to make something work regardless so we managed to get 20 trucks working see if we can get 200 like how that work now the scroll bar it just has to go I mean I logged that code for two days I went slightly mad as you might have noticed previously it did not help I still have no idea why it's slow for no reason but on the good side we can just throw this out it's just a visual thing maybe no one will complain if the scroll bar looks like a regular scroll bar if the application was at more than two frames per second you know now the next step was to fix the drag and drop somehow which is also fundamentally broken since it uses the data in the DOM to figure out wha where your mouse cursor is currently or what where you would be dropping the item you're holding on the bright side we generate these boxes on the scheduling screen from model data that we already have and we can in advance know exactly where a specific scheduled item is and uh, what its positions would be so in principle we can just generate this data in memory have the drag and drop library check there instead of the DOM and then it will be a hundred times faster so if we do these two things then maybe the application will be fast enough now we made a pretty brutal proof of concept to verify this where half of the application was unusable but the drag and drop and the scrolling worked fine I mean even I'm surprised but it did work fine and by fine I mean butter smooth 60 frame per second scrolling while dragging things around at 50 percent or even 25 percent zoom imagine that so in theory this is something that we could solve and the next step was to go into the code untangle all the various dependencies on these two libraries and try to replace them with our own solution how did that work um, well actually you will have to wait for the sequel to find it out because that never happened for budget reasons but our tale is concluded for now maybe it will be resumed at some point in the future so if you have any questions this would be the time to ask Sorry, go ahead. Did, you, did you ever consider to just fuck it and go do text user interfaces instead? <laughs> 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 they, they are quite pretty now with the last library anyway. Yeah, okay. So basically, the comment is that front end development sucks and I should quit my job and do something else. <laughs> I have considered that. I'm not going to do that. But uh, in this specific case, actually, we did consider talking with the customer to figure out what their actual use case was for this madness at the end like why, why do you need to zoom out so far and maybe we can give you a reporting feature instead which is done way less time than optimizing an application which was never designed for this so yeah, I hope that answers your question and 
something. <laughs> yes? Would you do that to be cheaper to give him? Or <laughs> <laughs> Very good. That, that was also uh, one part of the story, which I did not mention, that the CFO also walked by this faithful meeting where we checked out what the customer was doing and we discussed with them, like, why not just buy cheaper laptops? And, oh, okay, that, that could work. <laughs> so I think they did end up doing that. But that, of course, did not help. No, but I also mean, like, uh, because sometimes when you talk with clients and you're wondering, like, what is happening on their side that actually video or screen sessions can help you so much to understand what's going wrong. Yeah, for sure. Well, in retrospect, that is obvious. Yeah, no, but it's also, like, get their screen and understand what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. There were also reasons why that did not happen, but I would rather not go into that. And before Christmas or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah? Is it an option to be Angular and use something completely different? Well, we had a very limited time frame, so we're not going to rewrite the whole application. That, that was also a consideration. And somehow, for some reason, we were optimistic that we could fix this. I mean, we rewrote the whole screen, and it's going to be much cleaner and less structured now. So <laughs> surely, there is a way to get out of this mess we made ourselves. And actually, there would be. If you would have to do it again, the app, what would you change? Or what would you have done differently now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that would be no, no. Good, right? I mean, you would say that this library sucks, but another one takes you better? Or? No, that's, that's a valid question. I'm just thinking how to answer that in a way that will not get me in hot water. Uh, Why? Basically, a lot of the problems were not due to technology. That's, that's one thing that would need to change. To, well, like having a spec, that's, that's a good thing to have in advance. Talking with a customer, seeing what they're actually using it for, that's, that's also a good thing to have. But um, as far as the technological choice, I think uh, I'm actually fine with that. So, None of this came down to Angular. Most of these are fundamental issues with how, thing, how you can do things in a browser. So one option would be to not do this in a browser, but that was also a requirement. Yeah? Uh, Google Analytics has some like user timings API stuff like that. Uh -huh. uh, Google Lighthouse or something like that. For measuring or the performance. Mm -hmm. So you can set like, oh, how long exactly this took or this took. Uh, did you implement that, or maybe you know, or after, before, or did you did you see some some changes in the analytics? Because that would maybe proactively catch the issues with like the window is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. small, or only this browser is causing it, or you know, this type of computers. Mm -hmm. That that's a very good point, actually. Um, before we did not integrate this. After I don't know because I was off the project at this point, so. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but actually, other than this one customer, all the other people who were using the application were entirely fine with that. So we did end up with a useful solution in the end. And for, anal for analytics, yeah, it's definitely one way to ensure that they are still happy in the future, rather than just hope that nothing else will go wrong. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. Zoli, you also had a question? Is that it? Doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, it just, does, did anyone want to ask? Sorry. No, we can also <laughs> talk afterwards if you. Yeah. All right. All right. So thank you for your time. That, that was my presentation.